Chief Prime Minister Andrea Nicola, who is the second councillor, is that right? First, all oh, First, councillor, dedication of the European Union to Australia in New Zealand. Uh, now, you have uh, uh, Andrea's biography uh, on the, on, on the uh, leaflet, and I think maybe I should, because we started the discussion, I think we should just run straight away into, into the talk. Which will be about Europe and the Asia Pacific uh, today, right? And we are very excited because Andrea will have, I think, the rather pleasant task of handing prizes to our students, <laughs> which is always a very nice thing for all the people involved with this. So I'm sorry there's a kind of a change about classes and things. No problem. No problem. Uh, could we please? Formally welcome, and it was already in a sense been welcoming you know, into the discussion. Uh, <laughs> and let's launch. Uh, have you got a microphone? Yes, excellent. So, Europe and the Asia Pacific today. Thank you very much. Um, and, and again, I think, uh, as you said, a very good uh, transition from. Uh, the previous presentation. Uh, I've been asked uh, indeed to cover, uh, to address uh, the relation between the EU and the Asia Pacific. Uh, but uh, of course, I cannot avoid uh, uh, mentioning briefly at least uh, uh, the uh, European Union in general, the, the economic and financial situation, the Euro crisis, which has been already mentioned. So, first of all, I would like to make a, a fir uh, first uh, presentation on this. On this. Secondly, I will present you an outlook about uh, EU economic and trade relationship with the Asia Pacific. <coughs> Thirdly, uh, I will uh, refer to the EU development policy and what we are doing uh, with this part of the world. And finally, uh, what does all mean uh, in terms of EU Australia uh, relationship? So, to start with, uh, uh, of course, it is truly a, a, a universally acknowledged that newspapers prefer to report doom and gloom than success and glory, uh, maybe with the notable exception of sporting field. I have to believe this because, uh, despite the fact that the European Union Australia relations have been going on since, since 1962, and we are celebrating this year the 50th anniversary, the only time which uh, the European Union is seems to be mentioned in, uh, in the press uh, headlines in Australia is about bad news. And of course this year is no exception. Um, there are uh, constantly uh, headlines about the Euro crisis, the Eurozone, the, the, the fact that the, the disappearance of the, of the Euro is, is imminent, but I, let me reassure you that I think rumors of, the, of, the, of our debt have been grossly exaggerated. The European Union is, is alive, is, 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 uh, is still uh, there, and I think uh, the Euro also is, is there to stay. Uh, this is not to belittle the challenges ahead, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's a quite complicated and difficult time. There are challenges, and there are uh, challenges notably now in relation to the economic and financial uh, situation. Of course, to be part of the Eurozone, particularly the south of Europe, are going through a different, a very difficult time. So my own country, Italy, uh, but also lately Spain, uh, Greece, uh, uh, it, they are all undergoing a very painful adjustment process, uh, which is uh, working off the excesses that built up uh, in the years before 2007, uh, fueled by cheap credit and capital imports and wages that outpaced productivity growth. Of course, the shock of the financial crisis has raised the specter of, of a messy uh, default, uh, something which uh, uh, will create a huge uh, panic in, uh, in global financial markets, uh, to start with London. But, and of course, this, these problems are very, very serious. But what I would claim is that, uh, it, uh, and perhaps historically, if we look at uh, retrospectively the history of the European Union, it is uh, the improvements uh, have occurred once we have touched maybe the bottom. You probably need a crisis, if you, if you look at the history of the European Union, to uh, really make improvements uh, and, and, move, and move ahead. 
I feel that I must point out that even today we are more than just on the right track. Despite the initial appearance, the European Union as a whole and for the matter Euro are in pretty good health. A few um, figures. The EU remains, uh, first of all, remains the biggest, by far the largest trade power. Our good exports rose by almost 60% to 1.3 trillion euro in the decade 2010. Import rose by 51%. And while we do have a trade deficit, it is largely caused by our significant oil and gas bill. In manufactured goods, uh, our significant surplus, almost 190 billion euro, has traveled over the last decade. Secondly, the, Euros, the European Union share of world exports uh, is, is, is very, very strong, has remained stable at around 20% of the total over the last decade. And to give you some, some uh, comparison, over the same period, the US and the Japanese shares of exports fell by 6 percentage points to hit 12% and 6% uh, respectively. So overall, we're not doing too bad. The European Union also maintains its global leadership in high-level value-added uh, products. We account for about 30% of total exports and high-tech products, where our share was 17% in 2007. And research and development, uh, European Union is still the leading uh, player worldwide, with a very good contribution from the UK, for sure. More fundamentally, it is just plain wrong to say that Europe as a whole has a problem of competitiveness or that we live beyond our means. Just look at our current account, which is by a small amount in surplus. The euro remains and will stay the second reserve currency in the world. I must say that in Germany and countries in Northern and Eastern Europe, the feeling of economic crisis is very limited. Uh, crisis is very much felt in, in, in some parts of, of the European Union. Not, not everywhere. I do not pretend to downplay the frictions in the function of the monetary union. They are real and they are pervasive. But in terms of the fundamentals, the European economy still exhibits considerable strength and resilience. In terms of economic governance, Europe will exit the current crisis, uh, I'm convinced, uh, stronger than before. And in terms of economic weight, we will continue to play a major role. If in finding a way through, we'll have to deal with many structural weaknesses, uh, as I said before, uh, but we are slowly uh, getting there. However, it is important to focus not just on the challenges, but also on what we have uh, achieved uh, so far. And it is very uh, often, very common that you know, people look at the, very, at the bad news, at the negative side, and, and uh, uh, forget about what uh, we have made with the European Union, having avoided the conflict for, for uh, 60 years, and uh, basically we, we, we have uh, really set standards uh, worldwide for, in terms of, view of economic integration. It is said that limitation is the sincerest form of flattery. It was not long ago that the Foreign Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, talked about a community modeled on the European Union by 2020, the new body would, according to Mr. Rudd, share a comprehensive sense of community in security, trade, economics, and politics. And while the European Union did not represent an identical model for the Asia Pacific, it was the spirit we need to capture in our hemisphere. And that's, uh, of course, the Australian former minister of foreign affairs who said that, not a uh, European uh, uh, leader. The European Union as a model is something that many regions around the world are looking at. Take Russia, for example. As you will know, it is looking to establish by 2015 the Eurasian Economic Union, chiefly called the EEC, in a rather interesting back to the future use of terminology. So it's quite interesting. Mercosur is another example in South America, it's, it's, it's the South American leaders, leading trading bloc. And is known as the common market of the South. And it is not surprised that uh, it looked uh, very much at the European Union as an inspiration to, to set up its, its uh, architect architecture. But let me go, come to the second part, uh, uh, the core of my presentation, uh, an outlook of the EU economic and trade relationship with Asia and the Pacific. 
It seems that it is uh, indeed very fashionable. Like everyone is talking about this being the Asian century, or, or, or different variants. Australia is definitely seeking to best position itself for the growing influence of the Asian region through the Government Commission White Paper, uh, which is being uh, finalized, uh, Australia in the Asian Century. While, for instance, the United States has made reference to, to, to this being uh, its Pacific Century, so different variations, but more or less uh, uh, Asia is there. And of course, uh, Australia is indeed in a, in a central, in a bridging uh, role, uh, in a privileged position to, to take advantage of that. Uh, and of course, uh, this is one reason why the uh, European Union uh, is uh, so much interested in, in uh, deepening the ties with, with Australia, but I will come back to this uh, later on. What do we actually mean with, when we refer to the Asia-Pacific region? Uh, that's a question, because if you look at, if you take a map, uh, uh, and you will realize that uh, the Asia-Pacific basically includes uh, almost everything, every, every part, country in the planet, except, of course, the African continent and, and Europe. But you take Europe and Africa away, I mean, they, they all are in a way or another uh, related to the Asian Pacific. Asia is, of course, uh, a hugely diverse, diverse population uh, in languages, races, uh, religions, traditions, and cultures. It is also a crucial partner for the European Union, politically, economically, and culturally. The region accounts for more than half of the world population, <coughs> a quarter of the economic wealth created every year, and is home of, uh, to four of the ten largest economies in the world. Japan, India, Korea, and China, of course. Asia, Asia's economy's growth in the past two decades has been remarkable. Uh, most Asian countries are now members of the World Trade Organization, and many countries achieve growth rates above 5% or 7% if you look at India. Uh, and, and this is not something uh, uh, sort of uh, which happens in isolation. It is quite it is going on for the last 15-20 uh, years. So, so it, it is a clear trend. And this is partly due to increased openness, especially in East Asia and China, and the undertaking of major economic reforms. So no wonder that the emergence of Asia-Pacific is considered to be of, of great global uh, significance. Getting the EU, EU relations right with this diverse and very uh, heterogeneous and huge area represents many, many challenges. We are, of course, deepening our strategic partnerships with uh, China, India and Japan, and negotiations are under, well underway on new partnership and free trade agreements with South Korea and with, with Southeast Asian countries. Regular and wide-ranging dialogues take place, leading increasingly to cooperation and convergence on global issues, but touching uh, almost everything under, under the sun, uh, from security to research, uh, uh, development, uh, and other economic issues. And let's face it, Given our experience in, turn, in turning enemies into friends, voluntarily pulling sovereignty and achieving economic and political integration, the European Union certainly has something to offer, has a wealth of experience to share with the Asia-Pacific and future framework for global governance. What is the strategic framework uh, uh, that we have identified for our relation with the Asia-Pacific? We can uh, so to reduce it to six main uh, large objectives. First of all, uh, we want to contribute to peace and security in, in the region. Secondly, we want to strengthen mutual trade and investment flows and, and develop them, intensify them. Thirdly, to promote the development of the less pro prosperous countries of Asia and then address the root cause of poverty through the attainment of the minimum development goals. Fourthly, to contribute to the protection of human rights and, and, and the rules of law and the spreading of democracy. Fifthly, build global partnerships and alliances with Asian countries, which would help us to uh, address uh, the, the global challenges which uh, we have mentioned before, uh, including climate change and environmental security issues. And finally, help to strengthen the awareness <coughs> of Europe in Asia and vice versa, something which is, uh, of course, uh, ongoing. We should not forget that Asia has surpassed NAFTA in becoming Europe's main trading partner, accounting for a third of Europe's trade to trade flows. 
European foreign direct investment in Asia amounts to a third of European investment abroad. So we are talking about big, uh, big figures. Asia as a whole represents the EU's third largest trading partner outside Europe, after the US and China, with more than 20, 206 billion of trading goods and services in just to refer to 2011 last year. And the EU is Asia's second largest trading partner after China, amounting for around 11% of Asian trade. So much is happening within this region and among emerging markets worldwide. Trade between emerging markets, which rose from 6% of world trade in 2000 to 15% in 2010, is set to account 27% of world trade in 2030, and 38% in 2015. So it is indeed very, very significant. Europe, rather than seeing this as a threat, wants to use trade agreements and relations with this country as opportunities to tap into these resources of growth. And we do not intend just to watch uh, from the sidelines. For example, our free trade agreement with South Korea, which, was, which came into effect uh, very recently, was the first in a series of far-reaching FTAs which we want to conclude, in particular in, in Asia and within the Asian countries. Negotiations with Singapore are progressing well. We hope to conclude them by the summer of this year. The next on the list is Malaysia, uh, where we have just completed preparatory work. And we um, uh, are preparing to launch negotiations with Vietnam. And of course, we have not lost sight of our ultimate goal of achieving an agreement with the regional framework of Asia. I mean, we started with Asia, we realized that uh, this was not going to be possible because Asia is not as integrated as the EU, so it was not possible to negotiate block to block. So we said, let's go negotiate country by country and maybe we will come back. So we will see, but this is going to, to take a while. Outside, outside the Asian region, we are already negotiating with India uh, and exploring possible negotiations with Japan. We, we, we are, uh, we, uh, a decision might, might be taken this year, and with India, we hope to conclude the, the negotiation by, uh, by the end of, of this year. But of course, we remain con convinced that the best help to our trade with Asia is a, a strong conclusion of, of the Doha round. WTO negotiation and, and uh, trade liberalization achieved through uh, the WTO remains a priority. If you only think what has been, what has been possible to achieve by bringing China, China as a member of, of WTO, for example, in terms of regulatory improvement, transparency, etc., I mean, it, it's quite, quite amazing. So WTO remains very, very central, although the door around is, is certainly suffering. Today, we form the second largest economic partnership in the world between, with, with China, and it, in a, a remarkably short in, in time frame, our economies have integrated to a point where it is difficult to imagine one without the, the other. Our bilateral trade uh, in goods with, with China reached 430 billion euro in 2011, and we now trade over 1 billion euro every day. So while Asia comprises high-income industrialized parties and partners and dynamic emerging economies, it is also home to two-thirds of the world poor, something which, of course, we should not uh, forget. If, on the one hand, Japan and Singapore are among the richest economies in the world with per capita income in the range of $30,000 in purchasing power parity, uh, of course, Asia is the home of a number of least developed countries like Bangladesh, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, which remain by all means the, among the poorest countries in the world with, with a purchasing power parity per year of uh, about $2,000, uh, which, which is very, very low. While most of the economies of emerging East Asian countries are expected to continue to grow at high speed, high, uh, Pace, South Asia is characterized by low level of economic integration. And that's, that has to do probably because of they have a very low uh, level of uh, intra-regional integration. Uh, in, in regional trade in Southeast Asia amounts only to two or five, between 2 and 5% of total trade. Um, and this stands out against other regional grouping in the world in which intra-regional trade is very 
important. It plays a, a huge role in, in terms of, of economic development. Uh, for example, uh, comparing to Asia, in Asia uh, the, the intra-regional trade is 20% as opposed to 2% in the SARC in Southeast Asia. However, South Asia is one of the fastest growing regions in the world with a fast growing middle class, increasing investment in high technologies and skilled human resources. But institutional weaknesses, natural disaster, infrastructure, bottlenecks continue to hamper the development of, the, of this region and therefore makes reduction, reducing poverty uh, still a big, a big challenge. To um, move to the Pacific, uh, from a trade off point of view, uh, we are following a quite a different path uh, with, with this grouping of countries, which is, of course, uh, it is part of the Asia-Pacific uh, sort of macro region, but it is characterized by uh, very um, particular features being in particular small island states, uh, isolated, uh, and, and uh, regions, uh, generally speaking, relatively poor. So with these uh, Pacific countries, what we have embarked upon is a different, much more development-focused uh, kind of, of trade relationship. What we are negotiating are the so-called economic partnership agreements. So they are not free trade agreements, they are economic partnership agreements. The aim of this IPAS is to create a, a shared trade and development partnership <coughs> backed up by development support which will, we hope, through gradual and controlled liberalization of trade in goods over a reasonable period of time and set rules on sectors such as services and investment which can contribute to the development of these countries and to create job and, 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 uh, and growth. So far, uh, progress has been limited with the Pacific countries. Uh, we have in initial uh, interim economic partnership agreements with uh, Fiji and Papua New, uh, New Guinea. Um, and they include a duty and quota free export from PNG and, and Fiji to the EU. Whereas this country will have much longer transition time to liberalize, to open up their markets. And that's, of course, uh, a recognition of the asymmetric uh, relationship existing between the EU and, and, and small, uh, vulnerable, uh, and still poor countries. So, the, the philosophy behind uh, is that a gradual opening of, of these markets. Uh, will facilitate development, will facilitate growth, and will have them uh, uh, basically integrating more uh, uh, and better in, in the world market. And of course, we take uh, fully into account uh, the uh, development concerns and the sensitivity of, of various sectors. This brings me to my third part uh, of the presentation, in terms of what we are doing uh, in terms of development policy and, and efforts with the Asia and Pacific. From the outset, I, uh, I would like to uh, remind you that the European Union still uh, remains the largest uh, donor worldwide, providing 60% of uh, overseas development assistance. And to come back to one question which I think was asked earlier on, of course uh, we do have uh, development assistance, and we, have, we do have development funds which are managed at the European level, but of course uh, the UK and France, I mean, all, um, all uh, members of the European Union continue to have their, in parallel, their bilateral programs. What we, uh, of course, uh, 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 try to achieve is the, to uh, uh, have more and more synergies between the bilateral uh, sort of managed funds and the regional funds, uh, and the funds which are, which are managed at, at the European level, uh, but I mean, the, the two are, are complementary and go hand in hand. Another remark which I want to make when talking about Asia is that, interestingly enough, uh, there are a number of countries which are uh, moving from being uh, recipients of overseas development, of, of development assistance to being donors. <coughs> Take India. <coughs> India, I think, has officially become a, a donor uh, only last year. And with these countries, uh, uh, including China, where we still have uh, uh, the European Union is still uh, providing um, 
uh, development operation assistance, we are uh, indeed uh, migrating towards much more uh, partnerships between the EU and, and, and because you know it, it doesn't make sense uh, to have uh, uh, to treat uh, countries developing as developing countries, whereas they themselves are, are done. So it, it is, uh, although they have a big uh, pockets of poverty, etc., etc. Development cooperation, interesting that, is also becoming a more valuable component in the overall relation with Australia and New, and New Zealand. Mm. Australia is the first non-EU country with, with whom we have uh, an institute delegated, uh, the, the, the so-called delegated cooperation, which means that uh, the European Union will be able to transfer funds to Australia, for example, to, uh, if you want to finance projects in, in Fiji, we recognize that Australia is much better placed as a, as a comparative advantage geographically to deliver aid on our behalf, and we can do the same in South Sudan, where we have uh, well-established offices, uh, um, infrastructure and facilities. So the, the development cooperation, it is an area very important in terms of, of EU and Australia cooperation. So cooperation, the cooperation remains a, a, a very important pillar of our engagement uh, and, uh, with, with Asia and the Pacific. It remains high, high on the agenda and more than 5 billion euros have been allocated to Asia in the period between 2007 and 2013. Policy being put in place jointly to address common challenges such as climate change, sustainable development, security, stability, good governance, human rights, and the prevention of natural and human disasters. So we, we touch more or less um, all possible areas, but of course uh, the, the development assistance is very um, uh, diversified depending on which country we, we are dealing with, as I, as I mentioned earlier on. Asia's diverse environment is under growing pressure uh, as a result of, of, of population growth, economic development, climate change, and the transformation which is, which is going on uh, and uh, at the pace which is going on is tremendous. Asia does face enormous environmental challenges and it is acknowledged that economic growth has led to widespread degradation of environment in Asia. The fourth environment is one of the big uh, important areas where we are uh, uh, providing uh, Climate change is another key priority for the EU, and, and most Asia-Pacific countries are increasingly sensitive about the economic interests at stake. Sustainable use, for example, of their natural resources and their image abroad, and are serious about in investing in this process. We are working closely with countries on programs such as reducing emissions for deforestation degradation and the forest law enforcement, governance and trade, uh, two particular schemes. Which, help, which are put in place to uh, uh, help countries uh, dealing with biodiversity. And efforts to confront poverty, climate change, the financial crisis, uh, and, and name it, are uh, uh, underway in, in most of the countries in Asia. The EU is therefore stepping up its support to regional integration through the Asia Europe meeting and intensifying cooperation with ASEAN to the ASEAN Regional Forum and the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Uh, incidentally, the uh, Asian um, uh, institutional architecture is quite complicated, uh, as you all know. Uh, uh, but what we uh, have been trying to do and to offer to Asia is our comparative advantage in uh, um, building markets, in building uh, economic integration. So we have. Uh, Provided and we are supporting um, SARC, Southeast, Southeast, South Asian Association for Regional Operation. We are supporting ASEAN, we are supporting uh, uh, the Pacific countries in their efforts to integrate and more. On the Pacific side, I want to uh, uh, point out that the European <coughs> Union is the second largest donor to the Pacific countries. This is not uh, I think very well known in Asia, that's not something in Australia, not something that you read often in the papers. Australia clearly remains the largest donor because of its uh, geographical position and, and uh, its, its local uh, sort of superpower. 
but the EU is still extremely uh, engaged, uh, and uh, so it, it is in terms of level amounts of funding we are we are number two, just after Australia. And we are engaged in regular political dialogues uh, uh, with, with various countries uh, for, for, for the last decades. Uh, most of the European Union member states rely on the European Union to promote and deliver uh, foreign policy interests in the Pacific. Indeed, uh, to come to one other question before, we do have, uh, as a European Union, delegations in the smallest uh, countries in the Pacific, uh, Vanuatu, I mean, uh, for, for example, something which uh, member states don't have. So they. they they, they cannot deliver assistance and very often they rely on the European Union institutions to channel funds uh, simply because, because they, 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 they are not there, they cannot be present. EU funding for uh, uh, the Pacific uh, has totaled to about 800 million euros for the, for the period 2008-2013, so it's quite significant. Most of the Pacific Island countries and small island states, uh, 10 of which are among the world's 15 smallest economies. Pacific countries are slowly uh, recovering from the global crisis, uh, in reality through, due to Asia's uh, continued uh, robust growth, and certainly taking advantage also of, of the rela close relationship they have uh, with countries like China, China, which are more and more present in the Pacific. In, that, in 2010, economic growth was only 1% and is expected to be uh, around 1.8% in 2012. So it is remain low, it is re a group of very vulnerable countries which require a lot of attention and we do remain very engaged with the Pacific. There are three main reasons why we see the Pacific as a very, very important area. First of all, the Pacific Ocean covers a few one third of the Earth's surface, which means that environmental developments there will have a significant impact on a global scale, such as the future of the world's fisheries and climate change. It is certainly not the interest of the humanity to, to it is in this to the humanity to preserve the Pacific immense uh, biodiversity, much of which is not even known yet. And it has been estimated that as little as 20% of the Pacific Ocean's flora and fauna has been properly researched. So there is huge potential. The region is also has the only uh, fishing resources in the world which are not heavily overfished, including the world's largest tuna stocks. The tropical forests of Papua New Guinea are of global significance in terms of biodiversity and as regards climate change, uh, they, are, they are of central importance. If climate change continues, many island uh, uh, countries in the Pacific are going to disappear from, 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 the, from the world. So this, this, definitely these um, islands deserve a special attention uh, and uh, this region is likely to face in the future uh, significant environmental refugees uh, simply because uh, I mean, the people will have no choice but, but to move uh, from away from, from the, their uh, island. Secondly, we see this, the Pacific as a, uh, representing an important challenge in terms of stability and security. Considering that the number of Pacific countries have experienced conflict in the, last, in the recent past, continued vigilance in the world community and targeted support of addressing the root causes are uh, necessary. The consequences of instability in this part of the world can be dramatic in terms of, of lost uh, development opportunities. For example, tensions in the Solomon Islands reduced the per country per capita GDP by a third. On average, the economies of the Pacific countries are hardly growing while rapid population growth continues. If this trend continues and it is not reversed, it could trigger an explosive social and political situation as poverty uh, will worsen. And of course, Australia is uh, very much on the first line in that. Um, thirdly, Pacific countries are part of the wider Asia-Pacific region whose political importance, as I discussed earlier, is very is growing. Australia and New Zealand are key Pacific players, and EU relations with, with both countries uh, are solid and broad-based. We continue, we do have uh, very, very regular dialogues and meetings and, and coordination in what we call the trilateral 
between the European Union, Australia, and, and New Zealand. And as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, also arrangements to implement the delivery development assistance on, on, behalf, on behalf of each other. So we, we are very, very engaged. In terms of, finally, on the Pacific, we have just published, a, a new, uh, the European Commission has just published a new communication, uh, which is named Towards a Renewed EU-Pacific Development Partnership, which sets, uh, the, in broad lines, uh, the, the priorities uh, which, which I describe, uh, climate change, the engagement, and, and spells the commitment which the European Union wants to, to maintain with, with this path towards on. If you are interested, you can, of course, <coughs> Um, go and look at it. Now, coming to the conclusion of my presentation, um, what does all this mean in terms of the European Union and Australia relations? Um, it was said before uh, by Stuart that uh, Australia is, uh, in a way, the gateway to uh, a gateway to Asia and the Pacific. So it is uh, very much uh, 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 a privileged uh, role and privileged position to play. Uh, what is certainly clear is that the European Union and Australia are um, very close in terms of, of um, uh, having similar view of the world, uh, having similar values, common interest in Asia and the Pacific, common interest in uh, promoting uh, big, uh, fighting big challenges worldwide. We have a very, very similar uh, vision of the world as like-minded um, countries. So it, it is not a surprise that uh, we want to, to work more uh, with, uh, with Australia. And, uh, and therefore our leaders back in 2010 have decided to upgrade our relations and um, negotiate a, a treaty-level agreement uh, with Negotiations are, are very well advanced. Uh, we, have, we have already had uh, two you know, negotiating rounds, and we hope that we can conclude these negotiations by by this year. Uh, and this, by certainly, we will be able to put uh, uh, this relationship on a much more stable and, and um, permanent footing. Uh, uh, and and again, I mean, uh, I think we. we it's not, it's not a coincidence, it's not kind of a bureaucratic, we don't see this as a bureaucratic exercise, uh, just simply to have a new uh, piece of, of, of paper of agreement uh, or legal text, but uh, we need it. We, 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 we want to enhance this dialogue because from our side, uh, from the European Union side, we see uh, Asia and Pacific as an area of uh, increasing potential. We see Aust Australia being a, a bridge and, and having a, a special position. And for the European Union, for, and for Australia, European Union is, is a, definitely a, a, a partner which we cannot do without. So I think it's, it's a, a mutual interest. Uh, and uh, well, we'll see what it takes. So that concludes my presentation. And I'm happy.